About five years ago, I found myself in an exciting and a slightly terrifying situation. I had been teaching in Montessori classrooms at different times for about 13 years, and I had never taught all older children ages 9 to 12 before, nor had I ever taught in the public sector for the elementary age level. And I was very concerned. I was very excited. We were in a brand new building. We had amazing, beautiful brand new materials and a wonderful group of educators who were excited to start this new venture and some families that were very excited as well. What I found was the details of the day and the week and the year slowly but surely piled up on top of me and made it much, much harder for me to serve my students. That is the reason that I have created the Montessori for Everybody Consulting Co-ops. I believe that this is a way that I can help educators in similar positions, either they're brand new in public education and they've got some Montessori behind them, or they're brand new in Montessori education and they understand the public sector, or maybe they're just brand new altogether. I have some ways that I believe will allow them to start off better than they would normally and be able to succeed remarkably well even in their first couple of years in the classroom. If you are in a situation like this, if the educators in your school are, I encourage you to look at what we have to offer newsletters for parents that are already done for you. Edit a few dates, maybe a few other pieces, and the newsletter's ready to send out. Lesson plans, coordinated two common core principles, and allowing new educators to work through the Montessori curriculum over time while learning how it coordinates with the Common Core Standards in the United States. These are lesson plans that can take a huge amount of work off of a public educator or any new Montessori educator's plate. If you think these are things that could help you, I encourage you to explore the co-op, um, learn more about what we can offer you and your school. As you're setting up for a successful school year, I encourage you to look at the parts of the curriculum that take a little bit more setup and begin getting together the things that you'll need as soon as possible. This would include any hands-on science experiences that you want to do, bringing natural flowers and other plants into the classroom, any animals that you're going to have in the classroom, whether it's a, a whole project of, of ordering caterpillars and, and watching them move through the life cycle until they become butterflies that you observe and then release, or if it's having little containers so that as in, children find insects out around in your outdoor environment that you could bring them into the classroom for a few hours to observe. I encourage you to take the steps that you need to have the materials ready to do those experiences. Those are the things the students are going to remember that you initiate. The things that they initiate, they, those of course will be the memories that, that we're really going for, but in terms of the things you set out for them, those are the things that are going to strike that imagination, set the ball rolling for cosmic education. Now in this segment, the specific preparation that I'm going to talk about is for the great lessons. Now I think the great lessons are amazing and, and I hope that if you have had a formal Montessori training that you are able to experience them in all their glory. If you are an experienced Montessori classroom educator, I hope you've done everything you can to make them an exciting event and, and to present them with drama and excitement and everything that you can to make them what they're intended to be, a great lesson, a great introduction to an entire segment of the curriculum. So I'm going to use this time on video where I can actually show you things, not to give you a full list of things that you would need to present these lessons, but to give you some ideas of, of some little tips and tricks for, for setting things up and, and to just kind of give you a, a gentle reminder that, that you're going to want to take the time that you need to get a kit ready, a great lesson kit ready, so that you can present them with as much drama as possible. 
So if you're not familiar with The Great Lessons, I'm going to encourage you probably even before you watch the rest of this segment to familiarize yourself with them a little bit, to um, go to Miss Barbara's page, uh, probably one of the most wonderful online resources that, that we have available on The Great Lessons. If you have materials in your own training, manuals, notebooks, whatever on The Great Lessons, pull those out and review them if, if they are not something that's very familiar to you. So I'm going to talk now about presenting the first great lesson. And I do know that in, in some training programs, the first great lesson, which is typically either the story of the universe or the story of the earth, the story of the coming of the universe, the story of the coming of the earth, or both of those combined. I know in some trainings, they just teach you to tell the story with all of your good storytelling skills available. And, and I, I think that's a wonderful thing. I have not found that to be the very best way to introduce that whole segment of the curriculum. I found that a little bit more hands-on, a little bit more visuals, um, hands-on on me, because the way I present the first great lesson, it is a presentation where the group is just watching. They're, they're not touching too much, but but hands-on things that they see me doing or show them do definitely add to the drama. Now, before I show you some things about the experiments, you, or is one way to think about the, the way you can dramatize the, the great lessons, I'm going to talk a min minute about the images. Now, there are some traditional expressionistic um, charts of the different parts of the great lesson, the 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 earth when it was just a ball of gas, the, the, as the earth began to cool and the, the volcanoes came, there's charts that show winged beings, angels bringing water down and cooling the earth off and going back up into the clouds and gathering the water and bringing it down. I believe that this is a place where, where you need to be in, in harmony with the philosophy of your community. In some public school settings, any reference to deity, to, to God or whatever can be problematic. In others, as long as it's not a specific religion, you're okay. So, so organize yourself around that first. Get, get clear how you're going to make references that way. In most Montessori trainings, what we attempt to do is to give a kind of a blend of the, the magic of the coming of the universe and the hard science of, of what we understood happened based on the science that we have at this time. But how you do it is, it is an individual decision, but I encourage you to do it with careful thought to the philosophy of your community, including your larger community where your school is located. Now, in terms of images, besides some kind of impressionistic charts, uh, many of you, especially in a public school setting, may have smart boards or have uh, document cameras that project onto the wall where you could have large images behind you that, are, that we actually have available from the Hubble telescope, from NASA. These images typically are, are free on the NASA website for you to use in your classroom. Those can be very dramatic, especially if they're projected on a wall behind you. Use what you have. If you have books, if you have just printed 8 by 10 prints of the beauty of the universe, you can use those as well. But I encourage you to have some sort of a visual representation of some of the main parts of the story as you tell it and have those available to use and to show the children. Now, for some aspects of the story, it's really nice to have experimental uh, demonstrations uh, to, to demonstrate some of those aspects. Now, one of the ways that, that many educators in the Montessori classroom start the story off is with a representation of the Big Bang. The idea that at one time, all the matter in our vast universe was contained in a speck smaller than the smallest period, smaller than a period divided into a million pieces. And it was so hot and so dense that it was heavier than the heaviest thing you can imagine. So we start off with something that we can't show because there's no way to show it. But then we give a demonstration of how in a moment's time that speck, that that 
piece of matter that was of a quality we can't even really quite wrap our imaginations around suddenly expanded at a rate we can't even imagine and became the beginnings of all the matter and all of the, the items in the universe today. So one of the ways that you can do that, it's and the drama from your voice and your excitement are definitely the way you have to add the scale and the scope, is to start with a black balloon. And these are actually pretty easy to get at party stores. You want a kind of a good size big one, and you'll see why in a moment if you're not familiar with, with setting up this demonstration. For some reason, people like to use these for 50th birthdays or whatever, so you would rather not to have the number 50 on them or whatever, but just a plain black balloon as good and big and sturdy as you can manage. And then what you're going to do is you're going to fill that balloon with beautiful um, metallic confetti. And the easiest way to do this, in my experience, is to take um, a funnel and I've actually found the homemade funnel to be the best. Um, my goodness, my funnel is definitely, I'm going to have to make another one before I do this for real again because its it, it definitely has deteriorated as its uh, recyclable things are designed to do. But this is, is just a, a half gallon uh, jug that juice or milk um, came in and you just cut it off just with kitchen shears around so that it's like that. And then what you're going to do and this is why you want a good sturdy balloon and you want several because if you are putting this together the morning that you have set up for your children that you're going to present the first great lesson and then you bust the only balloon that you have, neither you nor they are going to be very happy about it. So you're going to want to have a couple in case you blow it and that's fine. And you're going to pull it around the neck of this until you've got the wider part of the balloon available so that you can get stuff in there. And this is why I said you want to have more than one available because if you get in a hurry, the likelihood you're going to break it is, is not small. And so you can kind of see that then you can get things into there a little bit better. Now, confetti is pretty teeny, so you don't have to have it too well set up. Then you're going to take your confetti put it down in and have something like a popsicle stick, nothing sharp, that you can then kind of push it down in until you've got this balloon as full of confetti as you can get it. Then once you've got all the confetti in the balloon, then you're going to carefully take it off because you don't want to have to do that a couple of times if you can avoid it. And then you're going to very carefully blow the balloon up tie it off and then you've got your big universe waiting for the Big Bang experience. You need to have then a pen um, uh, nearby. A, a, a push pen is, is kind of good because it's hard to lose them and it's easy to use. And then when you start your demonstration, you set it up kind of like I did for you and then you pop that balloon all over go those beautiful pieces. Now, if you are setting up for some of the later experiences, you would also have a large bowl. Clear is better. Um, um, I have used a, oh my goodness, I can't remember the name of the dessert, uh, a trifle, a, a trifle bowl, a clear glass trifle bowl or a large glass salad serving bowl is really nice. You would have that filled with water on a beautiful cloth. The beautiful cloth will help keep the, the metallic confetti a little bit confined, although there will be some classroom cleanup that, that you and your students need to do. But once you, you pop that balloon, the, the little fragments of confetti are going to float in the water and some of them are going to cling to each other and some of them are going to push away. And this is where you can give part of the first great lesson that describes how matter behaved in the universe, how some of the molecules of matter were drawn to one another and created solids, and some repelled one another and so were, were pushed apart and either were gases where they stayed um, uh, not joined together and, and just, just had random motion or where they pushed apart so that some of the molecules became this kind of matter and some became this over here. So that kind of sets it up for that next demonstration. Now if you are going to go there, you may want to include 
a demonstration of the three states of matter. And one of the ways that you can do that is with demonstrating them through the use of solid objects. So when we talk about a solid, we say that if you have a solid, it doesn't change. If you have older students, you may say it doesn't change size, it doesn't change volume, it doesn't change shape, it just stays the way it is. If it changes, it's no longer one piece. So I have my broken rock here. So if I am going to push the molecules apart for something that's a solid, I no longer have one solid, but I have two because it's broken, because of the nature of how the molecules cling together in a solid. To demonstrate a liquid, it's really nice to have BBs. And the reason I didn't put this all out before I'm doing this is because this segment is about the setup. This segment is about having things put together. And so when these things are stored away, my BBs stay stored in a plastic bag inside the container I'm going to use when I do the demonstration. And then I can show the children that just like these BBs behave, if matter is in liquid form, it behaves like this. It doesn't change its volume. It stays the same amount of material, but it changes its shape. If I were to not have this container, it would spread out all over the floor. I can push my finger in and it doesn't change its nature because its molecules are not as tight together as in a solid. And so then at some point I do let the children do that demonstration. Kind of depends on the group, how we're going. If they're primarily a younger group, lots of six-year-olds in the class, then what I might do is actually pass it around if I see the need for a little bit of movement. Otherwise they would be able to touch it and the broken rock on their own later. And then to demonstrate the gas, I just have some kind of fairly innocuous air freshener or even just a bottle, a mister in a bottle. If I'm going to use a packaged air freshener, I usually put a little piece of black construction paper around it so it doesn't look like Glade. It just looks like, you know, something uh, spraying out into the air. And I talk about how it doesn't hold its volume or its mass. Its molecules are now spread out all over the room. So these are some examples of ways that you can include demonstrations in your great lessons. The last one that I'm going to mention is the one that helps to illustrate how the different layers formed of the Earth and the way that solids, liquids, and gases behave in relation to one another, but specifically how heavier things go toward the middle of the Earth or the bottom of a glass. And so if you're going to do that, you're going to want something long and thin. This is simply a vase that is long and thin. And three containers, one for water, I usually color it with something, one for honey, and one for oil. Now in some of the traditional write-ups, you've got mercury, which we definitely don't want to use. You want to make sure everything you use with the children is safe. But if you use water and honey and oil, you'll find that if you pour them carefully, they will layer up in your glass and give a demonstration of how the layers of the earth formed with our heaviest, densest core, then the lighter materials, and the lightest materials being our crust of our earth. So I encourage you, think it out now. Lay out the way that you're going to present your great lessons. Gather objects for the timeline of life. Do what you need to do to be ready to present those great lessons with as much excitement, drama, and imagination as possible. So they serve their purpose. They strike the imagination of your students and draw them through their own curiosity into the study of the stars, the earth, the way that those things formed and their natures. And I wish you all the best. In part one of this two-part segment on the things you can have in your classroom to help you build community, we focused more on the active, proactive side of community building. We, we talked a little bit about how I believe, particularly if you're dealing with older children, 
the, the way to think about it is building community and turning more and more and more of the leadership for leading the community over to them. With younger children, if you are dealing with children, you are doing classroom leadership because you are leading them into appropriate, respectful ways of acting, but you manage the classroom. You manage the things, the paperwork, the, those sorts of things. And so in this segment, we're going to talk a little bit more about the management side. We, we will certainly deal with some true leadership and activity oriented things, but we're going to talk a little bit more how you can use objects to manage your community, manage communication in the classroom, and have uh, everyone taking leadership responsibility, responsibilities for being respectful and, and keeping everything running well in the classroom for everyone in the community. So I, I am going to mention a, a sort of a soft skill side of this before I talk about some of these objects. In some parenting, uh, I, I think it's mostly in the parenting literature that I've seen, I, I've seen people attempt to not say no to children. So even if, if they, they can't grant a child's desire, you know, the, the child wants to eat a snack now and it's too close to supper rather than saying, no, you can't have a snack. You can say something along the lines of um, either, depending on which school you go with, um, it's so close to supper, it wouldn't be appropriate to have a snack now, or um, I'm noticing that you're getting hungry, we're going to be having dinner in just 20 minutes, so it's, it's too close to dinner for a snack, something like that, or um, <clears throat> it's only 20 minutes to dinner. Do you believe it would be appropriate to have a snack now? Or it's 20 minutes until dinner. What do you think would happen to your appetite for the dinner foods if you ate a snack now? So I've, I've seen these kinds of ways of, of going about things. And I think that it's certainly better than a whole lot of negativity out in the environment. But the Montessori approach is a little bit different. Certainly, we want to minimize negativity, but even more importantly, we want to treat the child as an autonomous, um, well-organized human being who is capable of problem solving with us rather than being managed, rather than their behavior being modified. We work with them in community as we would work with a peer. Now, we take their developmental skills into account when we do that, but we don't manage them. Okay? So that's one of the reasons that I don't say classroom management for children, but for objects. But one of the things I have found, especially if you have <clears throat> a lot of children in your Montessori environment who are new to the environment, it's very easy to feel like all you're doing is saying, no, stop, don't do that, you, you, you're trying to protect the, the respectful work that's going on by stopping people all the time. So one of the things I'm going to suggest is particularly if you find yourself in that position, and I have found myself in that position, and I have, um, I have berated myself on the way home because I feel like I was, in Montessori words, Montessori's words, too harsh with children. If you find yourself in that position, I do believe that you need to consciously look for ways to not have negative interactions with the children. You need to look for ways to have the environment do some of that for you. You need to look for ways that, that you cannot be saying no to them, not be correcting their behavior as much. And I'm specifically going to suggest that their name, when you speak their name, that you associate it with positive interactions. Um, Jamie, um, would you like to come to this lesson with us? Or Jamie, it's time for the zoology lesson for your group. Would you join us at the rug now? Or Jamie, I noticed that you were really interested in elephants. The lesson we're doing now is on elephants. Come and join us. Rather than Jamie, move away from Tommy and stop disturbing his work, okay? So so one of the things that, that I do my best to do is to limit the nose, limit the negativity, and limit associating those things with speaking to the child and, and their name. So some of the things I'm going to show you, this will make a little bit more sense when, when I get there. Now, one of the things that I have found is that sometimes you can have objects in the environment 
give a message rather than you giving the message. And that is the case with a timer. Um, now, you may be in a position where you need to set a timer for some things and say, you know, when the timer is um, done, then so-and-so ha gets a turn or whatever. But ideally, you're going to have the children doing that. So if you've noticed that something is really popular in the classroom and a lot of children are wanting to use it, this is a one-minute timer. That probably wouldn't be used for that. But you may need to have them set a timer and then um, they know that it's the next person's turn. They have to put it back on the shelf or whatever. If you can get a countdown timer that can be managed either by you or an assistant, probably a little bit too delicate for students to use, although though I know some, some teachers do do that, you can set it where there's a, a little red uh, indicator that gets smaller and smaller, and so they know that's how much time is left before something happens. So use the timers where you can um, for that kind of thing. This is a stopwatch. Um, it's got a whistle on it because it's something that either my assistant or myself would use for recess time. And because I was fortunate in uh, some of the schools that I've worked at to have a very large uh, recess area, the whistle was used to let the children know it was time to come back in because they weren't always out to recess with, with another class. And the children can be taught to use the, the stopwatch timer for things like that as well. Um, this is a date stamp. And it can be used for a lot of different things, but mostly it just makes it easier for people to indicate, particularly in their journals, when they did their work. And now I do require that students be able to write the date properly before they're allowed to use the, the, the date stamp all day long. Um, so they have to write the date at least once a day if they can't spell all of the months of the year and if they can't write the days of the week and, and write everything out correctly. But once they can do that, then they're allowed to use the date stamp. So it helps me and, and my classroom assistant to know when things um, were done. Now, this definitely relates to not using the children's names um, or, or saying things when, when a negative is, is going on. This is a sound cue. Now, it's a pretty gentle one. It's a fairy chime or something like that that I got from, I think, a Waldorf-based um, uh, uh, mail order company, but if things in the classroom must be stopped as a class, usually because the noise level is just out of hand, I will use this. This is not for the silence game. Um, I use the signal for the silence game of a sign that it's, it's turned to the wall and you see a blank side with, when the silence game is not going on, and then either myself or a child turns the sign to show silence when the silence game is done. The silence game is not a way to create peace or a reminder of respectful noise levels in the classroom. A sil the silence game is a way to celebrate how we are able to enjoy the silence. So it can't be something that's imposed on people. It's something to be done when you sense that the entire class is ready to hold silence for a period of time. This is the classroom is just so loud that there are at least some students who aren't able to function. Now, I have found it's better than me shouting over <laughs> the class. And for students who just have not learned how to manage their, their voices, this can, can be a, a very worthwhile cue if you need to use that. Now, I've talked about using signs in the classroom to help children orient to what they need to do in an area or to remind them of, of the steps when they're cleaning up for lunch or, or whatever, that is one of the things that I would suggest is useful to avoid that um, uh, saying their names and saying no. So one of the things I was specifically referring to when I said not to have, not to say out negatives if you can avoid it, um, one school in particular where I worked, I guess the children had learned to call the teacher's teacher which I do believe is not a respectful way for students to address the teacher. Um, I have heard people say to them when they're, say to a, a child when they're called uh, teacher, would you like me to say student when I speak with you? If so, then, then we will have that be the convention between us. You call me teacher, I will call you student. If you would like me to call you Jennifer, 
then I would like you to call me Miss Susan. And so when I ran into that problem, rather than saying that and, and having to disrupt the, the, the main work of the day, this is what I would do. Now, if the children couldn't even read my name, they all knew the sound, so if they forgot my name, this was usually enough of a reminder, and if there were a child that I thought that was the case, I would specifically put my finger under the, the S, and usually then they could call me Miss Susan. So this is just one of those ways that you can set a standard. You can require a respectful behavior without adding a lot of ne negativity in the classroom. And when I'm observing, then this is the same thing that I would do. I have my observation badge on, and if a child forgets and interrupts me, rather than saying anything, I simply point at the badge, and then they know that they need to respect what my work is right then. Now, the little box that I have these in is been one of my little boxes for, for another purpose, which is written communication between me and the children. I've used this a tiny bit in the three to six classroom, but it's an essential part of the way that I work with students in an upper elementary classroom and even works well in a lower elementary classroom, assuming that you've got at least some students who write well enough to be able to communicate with you in writing. So I have a code. Um, if it is something that they need to communicate with me and it needs, to, needs my attention that day, they put it on a colored piece of paper. If it's something that, they, that only I can take care of, the classroom assistant can't take care of it, another student can't take care of it, but it doesn't need to be taken care of that day, then it goes on white. It can be an index card, it can just be white scrap paper that's cut up, it doesn't matter. But what they know that they do is then they get the paper, usually I'll have it set up where maybe papers are here, they write on them, and this isn't paper, but it's color, what I had that was colored on hand to, to demonstrate it. Then when they write a note, it, it, the, the, the blank ones are here and then the ones go back here. And the reason for this is if you are working in a Montessori classroom where you have a classroom lead who is the primary person presenting lessons and a classroom assistant who is the primary person managing the flow of assisting the children with work that's already been presented, then the person who's presenting all the time is busy in lessons most of the day. This is a way where I can check this between each lesson and then get back to children right away that day if I need to or prioritize. Now for those notes that are written on white, I found that I did have to create an organization system and I think this was a coupon organizer, I don't know. I think I got it at Target, but it's been a while. But it's just a little tiny folio, and I use this to organize things that I took care of the day that they happened. So if somebody put a note in, I took care of it, I filed it in one place. If it needs to happen the next day, I put it in one place. If it's something that my assistant really could take care of and the child wasn't, you know, maybe uh, uh, sorting that out well, I put it in another one. And that helped me to stay caught up on my commitments to the students, which is to take care of the things only I can take care of. And if you can't find something like that, something like a little, um, a, a small box designed for, for organizing a small number of index cards, I think would work just as well. Because this one, you may not be able to see the, the dividers, but there's little clear dividers that would allow you to set up a system like that. Now, timer, okay. <clears throat> this box is from the golden age of Ikea. <laughs> it's not available new anymore as far as I know, but, but it's something that, that I used at my station. Now, as a Montessori classroom lead, I never had a desk. I had a station, and it was usually a, a kind of like an end table um, bookshelf kind of a, a piece of furniture so that I could have books, my master notebook things down in the shelves, and then I could things have things up on the top that were essential for me. Sometimes I would use these in other parts of the classroom too. These cards that you see are for developmental movements. Um, this is one called palming. It's a way to rest the eyes. It's from behavioral optometry and a few other systems as well. Then acupoints. What these movements are, are movements that are designed to help the children get their state back together. So just as I point to my name tag or observing, 
I would, on occasion, if I noticed that a child was just not doing what they needed to, they had been presented how to use these cards to take a time out. Not a time out where I put them on a chair, but a time out where they move away from the regular work of the classroom and reorganize themselves. I would sometimes catch a child's eye and point to this box. That would let them know one of two things, depending on what I'd set up with them. One was go to the box, choose a card, do a movement. For children who really weren't able to manage themselves more carefully, it was that much of a specific directed um, uh, request that I made of them. Second, it might mean I think this would help you, but you need to do something to reorganize yourself so you're behaving more respectfully. So the reason that I've shown you these things is I encourage you to look for ways that you can set your classroom up to help the community work together. The children appreciate little gestures like a timestamp. They like that they don't have to write the whole date out on their work every time. When you do little things like that, they feel like you're working with them. You're not imposing things on them. You're working with them so that the day can be easier, it can flow together better, and you can work the best possible way in your community.